Silver bullet or hoax? And we're just uh, quickly putting in a new computer. So. Yeah. Do you need this? No, I shouldn't be able to go commando for an hour or so. Okay. Okay. See, right, this is the file I want to put on. So let me, when I bring this machine up, I probably want to be plugged in because that's where, that way it sees the, uh, sees that screen. Yes. Okay. So let me bring the machine up here. Okay, so I'm Lucinda Lan. I'm the Acting Exec Executive Director of the Mars Society. I'm going to moderate this panel. Again, the title of this panel is The Vasimir Drive Sil Silver Bullet or Hoax. Uh, if you're not familiar, the Vasimir Drive is a propulsion system um, uh, created by um, Chang Diaz, a former astronaut. Um, and he has uh, said that, or news has said that uh, it'll get us to Mars within 36 days, I believe that was the le recent report. And just let me introduce you to our panelists and I'll let them start us off with some 10 minute intros on their take on um, this new propulsion system. I have to my immediate right is Rob Terry, uh, Richard Heidman, we have Jeffrey Landis, and Dr. Robert Zubrin. Go ahead. I'd prefer to be there. Uh, very quickly, uh, I'm just going to try and introduce a few concepts and questions about Vasimir. I've spent some 30 years in plasma science in high density, high energy plasmas and low density, low energy uh, plasmas. And Vasimir has always been a, a topic I've followed. It, had it been on Twitter, I would have been a Twitter follower of Vasimir like for years, you know. And it's always been a, a, sort of an amusing uh, bit of technology. But the, the issue is, is it amusing enough? And so I'm just going to set my own discussion. I'll give a little bit, a couple of moments, a summary of what Vazimur is. Are there conditions where Vazimur would help? How could it help? Where are its leaks and its losses? How well are the figures of merit verified for Vazimur? How do they compare with other kinds of drives that you might use in in-space propulsion? And finally, how much TRL improvement for the dollar can you get? Uh, essentially, technology readiness levels are NASA's yardstick for when something's ready to do anything that you're interested in. How many dollars does it take to move Vasimir a few TRLs compared to something else? Okay, so let's get into it. All right, uh, back in uh, 2006, uh, myself and Tom Hill and Ralph McCartney published a study about comparative masses and energies for lunar and Martian missions. The upshot of that study was it's cheaper to put a payload on Mars than it is to put the same payload on the moon. Why? Because you can aerobrake on Mars. Do not try to aerobrake on the moon. Bad idea. <laughs> so the amount of fuel that you carry to bring something to the moon costs you back in LEO. So from that paper, a figure of merit kind of winkled out in our minds called the mass advantage for Mars. And the mass advantage is really just this ratio. If I fiduciate things to sort of the mass I can throw to the moon, and then I compare how much mass can I throw to Mars for the same mission profile, for the same set of tankage fractions, for the same set of stages, everything else the same, asking how much, I have a fixed amount of mass in LEO, 
How much mass can I throw to Mars compared to the moon? In the example of that paper, we looked at, at aeroshell fractions, which I can generalize to aeroshell or EDL mass fraction. We looked at specific impulse of the driver, but not just any driver, one stage of the mission, the translunar injection or the trans-Mars injection. That's the place where you'd get most delta V for your work, okay? That's where you have to put the most delta V into the mission. So the mass you can throw to Mars is sensitive to those two things. It's sensitive to the ISP you can use for the injection stage, either Mars or lunar, and it's sensitive to the amount of parasitic mass that hangs on your payload, your EDL mass fraction. Now, I want to point out very quickly, I took the figure in that original paper and I extended the axis of specific impulse. Up in the original paper, we looked at 900 and 1,000 or so near where nuclear thermal rockets can sit. So I pushed it on up to see what would happen to these trade-offs when I got into the domain of Vazimer, which is 10,000, 20, 15,000, maybe even 30,000. Well, up, upshot is, if Vazimer was going to be useful for you, you'd think that if you walked across here, keeping fixed mass fraction and increasing the ISP, you would cross a lot of colored bands. As the more bands you cross, the higher your mass advantage goes. Lo and behold, for where Vazimer sits in this trade space, you've finished. Basically, when you go and fix the mass fraction uh, for EDL and change only the ISP, you're saturating. When you move in this direction, you cross only a few bands. If you want to really increase the mass fraction you to throw to Mars, you fix wherever you can go in ISP and monkey with the EDL fraction. That's the way you cross more and more bands. And as it turns out, I thought these curves would maybe saturate at a factor of three, but I don't care what I do in the trans-Mars injection. I can have a hyperdrive in trans-Mars injection. They all pretty much saturate at about 2.4 mass advantage to Mars. So the trade space in Vazimer's direction is weak. The trade space in fancy and better high, high mass EDL on Mars is strong. So my point is, even if Vazimer works, there may not be a use for it in the context for Mars. Now, the next question, is, now, now this other set of questions, and I'll go through these quickly and we can return to them later through more details. Where are the leaks and losses in Vazimir? There's a radial plasma flow, there's a radial neutral flow in the vacuum. Radial flow doesn't do anything for your rocket. Uh, there are charge separation and accumulations of charge on the rocket vehicle. There is about a 20 volt, and at higher power and higher thrust, it might be more uh, potential downstream of the Vazimir rocket. If you let that potential persist and you push all that charge out in space, now you've got yourself an electrostatic rubber band. You threw all this charge out there. You've got charge on your rocket. Now the cloud that's following you is trying to contract, and that's effectively pulling you back together. Whatever is thrust you did to build that charge is trying to slow you down again. It's pulling you back. And so you're, you haven't really had a net thrust respect to your center of mass. Your rocket has to throw a neutral flow. Otherwise, electrostatic forces will accumulate and you'll be dragging this big cloud of charge and it'll be slowing you down. So rockets as we know them, Huntsville thrust as we know it, always throws a neutral flow of gas, not a charged flow or a conducting flow. And so you have to be careful of that. There are radiation losses that have no particle heating. Even when you have 98% uh, efficiency, which Vesemir advocates claim between DC and RF, that 2% is still a huge amount of radiation to get rid of in heat. There are magnetic flux dissipations in any metal that constrains the magnetic field. And so let's take a look real quickly. How am I doing on time? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, real, one, real, one real quick. The one last one. Magnetic flux, here's what Vazimir looks like in its laboratory experiment. Here's basically what it's trying to achieve. DMDT times exhaust velocity is what you get for the thrust of a rocket. Basically, it always boils down to this. Most conventional thrusters have huge DMDT and modest V exhaust, so the specific impulse is down in the hundreds and uh, DMDT is in the kilograms or, or, or thousands of kilograms per second. 
So